Welcome to Innovation in Education. I'm your host, David Adams, CEO of the Urban Assembly. And on this show, we bring guests every single episode who have made things work in public education. This show is about the innovators. This show is about the folks who are solving problems. This show is about making things work in education. Now, there's a lot of shows out there talking about what's wrong in the education systems, and those are great shows. There's some shows talking about what we're not doing well, and there's a lot to learn from those, but that's not this show. This show is going to be featuring educators who are making things work for young people and improving public education. Welcome to our show. I am David Adams, and I'm joined here by a special guest, Dr. Aaliyah A. Samuel. Dr. Aaliyah Samuel is currently the president and CEO at Castle, spearheading initiatives alongside other educators, researchers, and policy leaders to expand social and emotional learning nationwide, serving as a leading voice for children's education. Dr. Samuel is bilingual, and she is an executive leader with expertise from early childhood through higher education. She previously served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary, Local, State, and National Engagement at the U.S. Department of Education, and as a senior fellow at the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University, as well as the former Executive Vice President of Governmental Affairs and Partnerships at NWEA. Prior to NWEA, Dr. Samuel was the Director of Education at the National Governors Association. She's worked with diverse constituencies, philanthropies, and national partners. Dr. Samuel holds an undergraduate degree from Tuskegee University, a master's from the University of South Florida, and a specialist and doctorate degree from Nova Southeastern. Dr. Samuel, I know you as Aaliyah, and welcome to our show, Innovations in Education with David Adams. How are you today? I'm doing great, David. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm excited to have you here, and I'm looking forward to this conversation as well. Dr. Samuel, we went through this extensive bio, everything from the federal government to a local state teacher that you were working in as an educator itself, which wasn't in your bio, but something I know a little bit about you. And you've been an educator for life. You started out in education, and education now. Tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to lead the social emotional learning work as the CEO and president of Castle. Thanks, David. You know, it's interesting. This is my 23rd year in education. That anniversary will actually be this August. So I'm looking forward to formally celebrating 23 years. And, you know, of all the things, what I take the most pride in is the fact that I am a pure educator serving in this role. I started my career as a special education teacher and went what, on what? to become an... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A reference of special ed, you know? Yes. And, you know, really, that's where I cut my teeth. Then went on to become an assistant principal, principal. And over my 10 years across two states, I really had an opportunity to understand on the ground, what education is really like and the realities for our students, our families, our educators. And the catalyst for change for me was really the recognition of the impact of policy on everyday lives and how I just fundamentally believed and saw firsthand the lack of parent voice and educator voice at the policy table. And I just felt that through my personal experiences, life experiences, and work experiences, that going into the policy pathway was really the next kind of version of my career. And, you know, I like to say that in every shift that I've made, it's been because of purpose and passion, which has been really how my career has unfolded, is just doing what fundamentally in my heart I believe in and taking that leap of faith that it, the next thing is the right thing. And so really, it's just been an honor to look back on my career. And, and really what brought me to Castle was that purpose and passion. Mm -hmm. I served as an advisor to Castle CSI when I was at the National Governors Association. And Castle was a resource. And as Castle was getting ready to launch their Collaborating States initiatives, I was already working with states and governor's offices on a variety of education issues. So got to know Castle very closely at that time, never thinking in a million years that fast forward five years, six years later, I would be coming back as president and CEO. But really my decision to explore Castle as my next stop on my professional pathway came from the time that I was serving at the U.S. Department of Education. And during that time, we were traveling from school to school, community to community, and really hearing firsthand how social emotional learning was the number one priority and challenge for districts as they were getting ready to reopen and really open the school doors again. 
Right. And so I just knew that SEL and really thinking about the impact of the social emotional learning and academics on our kid would make SEL the education priority. I also, when the pandemic started, my boys were in kindergarten and third grade. So I also saw it firsthand as a parent. And so I really just believe that social emotional learning and academics is our pathway to the future. We can't bifurcate the two. We can't, you know, address the learning loss without dealing with the relationship loss that has impacted so many of our students and educators and communities. And so that's really what brings me to the conversation today. Aaliyah, before we get to questions that dig a little bit more deeply into SEL, I know when I'm on podcasts, I like to shout out my boys so that they can listen to it and be like, oh, this is what my dad does all day. So I know you (laughs) talk about your boys and your family. You want to give a shout out to your boys here about their social emotional learning and development and what their mom does on a consistent basis to support that? Absolutely. You know, right now, both my boys, my oldest son is 12. His name is Chaz and my youngest son is eight and his name is Cruz. And ironically, as I travel across the nation and have a chance to spend time in schools, I always bring something home. Mm -hmm. And one of my learnings that I most recently brought home and I'm implementing at home is I am cards. And actually, David, when I was visiting urban assembly schools in New York just a few weeks ago, uh, we were in a public school, an elementary school and a middle school, and they had I am, I am smart, I am kind, I am thoughtful around the mirror. And I thought, oh my gosh, why am I not doing this for my son? So I have implemented I am's around their mirror and their bathroom. And right now, each child is working on a different piece. My oldest son says he wants to work on being more thoughtful. Mm -hmm. So his I am is I am thoughtful. And he thinks about during the day how he's expressing thoughtfulness or being thoughtful towards others. And my youngest son, his word is curiosity. Mm -hmm. And so he is resisting the temptation to come to a quick conclusion and exploring how to be curious every day, whether it's at home or at school. And, you know, things like that, that I pick up in the field. And these are just extraordinary educators who are making sure that every child feels valued, seen, heard, respected. I'm able to bring home. And so they know, oh, mom's coming off the road. She's going to do something else in the house. But it's just really, it helps give me even practical tools as a parent, to better parent my own kids. And so shout out to the boys for both exploring thoughtfulness and curiosity. Well, Leah, you are a much more insightful parent than I am because I bring home keychains when I'm just from <laughs> places. So shout out to your boys for having a mom who, who cares about their social emotional development and is pulling that from all different places. So I actually want to go back because you and I were recently featured in an EdWeek article and they were talking about what is social emotional learning as a definition? The conversation was from experts all across the country and there were different understandings and analogies. And this is a question I get a lot, right? Like, David, what is social and emotional learning? And we talk about inter and intrapersonal problem solving, but I want to turn this over to you, Elias, yeah. so that our audience and my audience understands what do we mean by social and emotional learning? And why is it that when you went around all across the country, this was one of the number one things in district said, I need support around this in terms of it's important in 2023 and beyond. So, you know I'd like to emphasize that social emotional learning is the process in which we learn. So you can't, again, bifurcate them because the process in which we learn is social and emotional. And, you know, you mentioned I do have an early childhood background. And whether you're looking at kids from early infancy, toddlerhood, and even into young adulthood, how they're learning is through social interactions, Mm -hmm. through those connections with others. Right now on this podcast, what are we doing? We're having a conversation, a social interaction on a topic that we want to help others understand. So what we're talking about, the core tenets of learning or social emotional learning, it's a lifelong process. It is how we develop fundamental skills like building healthy relationships. How do we practice curiosity? How do we work through really complex challenges, whether they're academic challenges in the classroom or social challenges, as we learn how to develop peers, how to navigate different social circles. It's about how to think about making decisions that not only benefit us, but others as well. And so Mm -hmm. there's so many tenets about social emotional learning, but at its core, 
it is who we are and how we're wired as human beings, mm. which is why, you know, to go to your question on what did I see that was so important, I think about a teacher in Charlotte. She was out of Charlotte, North Carolina, veteran teacher, 34 years, who said to me, Dr. Samuel, we can't return to learning until we return to the relationships that we've had. And here is a veteran teacher who is seen as a team leader at her school site, a leader in the community, an anchor of a school building who's saying, you know what? I can't get back to just teaching the kids until we reestablish the relationships, until we address the impacts of the social isolation and loss for so many. And so I just think that's one example of the importance of social emotional learning. I know you and I talk about the research a lot. You know, there's research study after research study that has shown the positive impacts when kids are in school environments where they feel seen and respected, where there is a focus on the skills and the competencies that we're talking about. And so holistically, we are in a moment in time when our kids are telling us, hey, I need something different. Just last school year, we had over 44% of our high schoolers reporting persistent feelings of hopelessness. Mm. Our chronic absenteeism rate is still at 22%, which is higher than pre-pandemic absenteeism. And we have to ask ourselves, why are our kids not engaged? Why are they anxious? Because nobody can focus on anything when they're stressed or anxious. And right now, our entire communities are stressed. Our kids are stressed. Parents are stressed, educators are stressed. And so we have to take a moment to address not just the humanity, but the impact of what the last few years have done to be able to then recover on the academic side. But this all seems bread and butter things. You're talking about decision making. You're talking about mm -hmm. things like learning how to manage and regulate our anxiety and our emotions mm -hmm. and relationship skills. I, I mean, this seems like part and parcel of what it means to be educated. But I'm reading there's a lot of pushback around SEL in the country around things like decision making, around things like self-awareness and self-management. So how can we understand that? And what do we need to do in the field of SEL to manage that pushback effectively so that students can learn these skills that you just talked about, research shows, is really mm -hmm. important to their thriving and development? I totally agree. Like this is getting back to the basics in so many ways. And I believe that part of why we have questioning around social emotional learning and its importance and its significance is because we are at a period of time when there's more attention on the field of education because when schools closed down, it impacted the economy, it impacted parents' ability to work. I mean, we saw firsthand how fundamentally important the institution of public education is. And so now we have everybody paying attention to it and almost feeling like because they went through school, they understand what schooling is. And it's one thing to matriculate as a student. It's another thing to be an educator, a teacher who's in the classroom every day, who understands the pedagogy, who understands the core tenets of what makes a good classroom, a good school environment. And I think it is an opportunity for us as educators to do what we do best, which is to educate. Mm -hmm. Right now, we just need to spend time unpacking a very technical term of social emotional learning and making it practical and easy to understand. And not just practical and easy to understand, but very clear on how it shows up in the classroom being very clear on what we talk about, what is SEL and what is not SEL. Mm -hmm. Because another part of the tension is there are things that are happening in classrooms that aren't directly tied to SEL have now become put under the umbrella of social mm -hmm. emotional learning. Mm -hmm. So there's some real clarifying points that we as a field need to understand. And we can't shy away from really difficult conversations because the going and just retreating to our own corners and saying, well, I'm not going to talk about it is not what social emotional learning is. Number one, we should have an awareness of ourselves, of our needs, and be able to have a social awareness to be able to work with others. Like this is part of what we're trying to do at the core of the principles. Mm -hmm. And so I really think being very clear on what SEL is, what it's not, showcasing the research, highlighting, you know, there's 82 evidence-based programs that can be implemented 
encouraging communities and schools to work together to identify the right approach, the right curriculum that works for them, and really being that broker of knowledge to help combat some of the misinformation that is prominent. And, you know, as I think about parents, because I am a parent, there's so many parents who are afraid of what's going to happen to their kids as a result of the pandemic. They're worried about their academics. They're worried about their social skills. They're worried about their friendships and their relationships. And we have to get to a place where we can move from parent fear to parent hope. And to help parents understand what are these core tenants and how they show up every day and how they can model these SEL skills and competencies so that their kids not only are hearing it in school, but they're seeing adults who also model these behaviors so that we can really make a shift in how we educate and support our kids. What's so interesting about that as we talk about relationship building, perspective taking and understanding that pushback is I understand that across the world now, there's more engagement in SEL than ever before. So there's this strange kind of juxtaposition where there's some challenges here in the States, but there, are, I understand countries who are looking to adopt this into their educational pedagogy or working mm -hmm. with CASEL to ensure that young people have these skills because they're motivated by the research. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you're doing outside of the US and how that informs some of the criticisms that you see within our country? Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. And I will say it was one of the things I was most surprised as I wrapped up my first year in this role. You know, I'm now in year two. But in my first year, we received over 101 international requests for supports, whether it was online professional development, whether it was actually having a team boots on the ground to visit a certain country to help provide professional development to actually countries wanting to establish a castle brand organization within their country that can help focus on the same thing. So there's a huge international interest. And I really like to say that SEL is a global priority. And we saw that firsthand. Last year, I was invited by the first lady of Israel to meet with her to talk about what is social emotional learning. What does it mean for educators? What does it mean for young people? What does it really mean? And it was an extraordinary opportunity to meet with her, the mayor of two cities, one from a rural area, one from an urban area to talk about social emotional learning countrywide. I was also asked to go to Australia, same conversations, meet with the heads of their education department to talk about social emotional learning. And also in Portugal, I was invited to go to Portugal. Same thing. These are three countries within a six month period that asked us to come because of the not just global interest, but an interest to expand SEL within their entire country. Mm -hmm. And a big part of it is because the world is only getting bigger. Our digital world, the technology is only opening up the world. So we all need to know how to, you know, use these skills in proactive ways. And so there is a huge international push, which to me, every time I come back, I say it, whether it's in a blog or in a keynote, that we cannot afford to play politics with social emotional learning or our education because other countries are prioritizing this. And if we're not careful, we will be eclipsed both academically, but also from a social emotional learning and life skills perspective. Well, before we get to that space, we know that International SEL Day is coming up and uh, we're going to ensure that folks recognize the importance of these skills and the importance of this engagement in education. And so this year's theme is actually uplifting hearts and connecting minds. And I wanna think about what it means to uplift hearts and connect minds and the role that SEL plays here, because you already talked about the importance of hearing folks who disagree, taking their perspective or understanding their perspective, I should say, being able to build relationships. You, you talked about what other countries are doing to remain competitive and increase their competitive vis-a-vis their investment in SEL. But let's come back to the U.S. and uplift hearts and connect minds and think about what SEL means in that space and why is it important in 2023? So I love this theme and, you know, it kind of goes into where I was mentioning earlier of moving from fear to hope. Mm -hmm. And I think SEL very much can do so. And, and I want to give a personal example first. My eight-year-old is what we call twice gifted. He has a medical 504, but is also in the advanced academics. 
And he really struggled in his school last year with fostering relationships with his classmates. He just didn't feel like he got along, which that ultimately wasn't the bigger issue. The bigger issue is he didn't have a relationship with his teacher to be able to share how he was feeling and what was happening in class. And we went from having a kid who loved to go to school that now he was like, mommy, my favorite part of the day is dismissal when I just get to come home completely disengaged, not doing well academically, not, I mean, battles to go to school. And we made the decision as parents, a very hard decision to remove him from the neighborhood school and put him in, they call it a gifted center. And it's a site that has a cohort of kids that are in the advanced academics. And that's not what was the catalyst for change. But what was, was his relationship with his teacher. Mm-hmm. He then, this year, he has a teacher who, you know, really just speaks life into him, challenges him, encourages him to do better. And one particular day, he was absent because his brother broke his wrist. So, you know, he was absent from school. And then when he went back to school, his teacher, Mrs. H, said, Cruz, when you're not at school... I miss you because you're the light of my day. And so he came home and he said, mom, I can't miss school anymore. I'm Mrs. H's light. I'm the light of her day. And he has not been absent one day. There is nothing that Mrs. H can't ask him to do that he won't do or try for her. Mm. And so we're seeing him excel academically. His confidence with his peers is growing. Why? It's the power of those relationships. It's the power of encouraging kids to be persistent, to be curious, to think Mm -hmm. about the perspective of others. And really at a time when it's so easy to not, I think uplifting these skills and what it can do for just increasing understanding. If we Mm -hmm. could just even get there, I think we're on a pathway to a much better world and future for everyone. That's amazing. And as I'm thinking back at the story, this relationship that your son's teacher built helped him kind of activate his own motivation and his goals and persist through difficulties and the power of relationships to really bring out the best in learning is something that I think SEL is uniquely situated to help elevate. And I just appreciate your story and your son. And tell me a little about what Castle is planning to do for SEL Day and SEL Week and how you guys are helping to uplift hearts and connect minds in this coming SEL celebration. Yes. Yes. Well, we are really looking forward to it. We are not only looking forward to engaging with governor's offices who will be having proclamations establishing SEL Day, but we're actually bringing the entire Castle staff together to Washington, D.C. Yes, yes. We're really excited. You know, in this virtual world, we are being intentional on how we convene as staff, how we continue to foster the relationships with each other in this remote world. And so we are, as part of SEL Day, we'll be coming to Washington, D.C. to be able to have Hill visits and meet with certain stakeholders on the Hill. Are they sleeping over at your place, Elia? Is that (laughs) going to be sleeping over? Sleep over, but I am thinking about having a dinner for a few of my closest colleagues. So Fair we'll enough. see how it goes. But yeah, really engaging and being able to highlight the voices. You know, we're planning a panel with local superintendent, a teacher, a student talking about what SEL means for them. And we also are really excited. We're going to be launching a campaign to do just that to elevate the personal stories. Because I think part of what has gotten lost in this debate on what it is or what it's not are the everyday students and teachers who are being impacted the most. You know, I think about how can we continue to elevate and put faces to names because this isn't just an abstract theory. This is real people who are being impacted positively by having these skills and competencies. And if not, there is a negative impact and we have seen it. And so I think it's important to elevate those very personal stories. So we're going to have a whole campaign around real people talking about what SEL means to them. And you seem to be very confident that engagement on an authentic dialogue can really bring folks together around the importance of SEL. You seem to have a lot of confidence that sharing the research, talking to parents, really elevating stories of what social emotional skills means can help bridge us together so that our kids can benefit. 
I a thousand percent agree that the power of relationships and having authentic conversations, because, you know, you can't get to a place of a consensus and again, not necessarily agreement, but at least consensus without having very honest and open conversations. And one of the things that gives me such confidence is I am not talking about this from an ivory tower perspective, meaning I'm not just sitting within the walls of the ivory tower spewing out what I think is real or what I hope is real. But I speak to this from 10 years being in public school, Mm -hmm. seeing it every day. I'm speaking to this as a parent who saw firsthand my 12-year-old, who at the time was nine, saying that he felt like not being able to talk to his friends or play sports felt like being in prison and the impact that that had on him. Yeah. I also am very fortunate that I travel. I am out in the field. I am talking to parents. And to me, if you don't want to hear my story, that's okay. But let me share with you the story of a mom in Dayton, Ohio, whose third grader was having the same challenges as my son. And when she asked her son, is there somebody at the school you can talk to? He said, no, nobody even knows my name. So how the impact of this third grader not having relationships to share how frustrated he was feeling and the dynamics that that created at home to talking to school district leaders in Texas who are like, you know what, we are going to establish a parent advisory committee to help us understand what are the SEL priorities for our community and what's the right program that can fit our needs. And so when you lift the hood up and you spend time getting your hands dirty, you know, tinkering around, really building those relationships, Mm -hmm. that to me is where the power comes from. Because There may be some who want to discredit me just because I'm the president and CEO of Castle without taking the time to know me. But you can't discredit the hundreds of parents that I've talked to, the hundreds of educators that I've talked to, the dozens of schools that I've walked the halls. That's where the truth is, is right there. So it sounds like you're not only the president, but you're a client of the SEL nation. Uh, (laughs) You you believe in the relationship (laughs) building. You're building the skills, you're putting the time on the ground, you're taking the perspective, you're working to understand so that we can come together, not necessarily an agreement, but a consensus around what social emotional learning can do for our communities and for our children when we do it right. That's right. That's right. And I would even venture to say that my husband believes I've become a better wife the more I practice the competencies and the skills. Now that is something. (laughs) Yes. So I'm telling you, it impacts all parts of your life because who can't benefit from taking a moment to say, you know what? I really need to be self-aware right now and acknowledge that I'm frustrated. I need to take a step back, process my frustrations, and then be able to come back, you know, in a real way. So it's not just our social relationships, but our more intimate ones as well. And then, you know, you're a CEO, I'm a CEO. If we think about the people who are most likely to be terminated from employment are not people who have the academic or tech skills. It's the ones that make poor decisions. It's employees who don't work well with others. These skills show up in every aspect of life. So why not create an education environment where kids are most of the time, where they can practice these skills with their peers and classmates to be able to then have them innately because SEL doesn't teach kids or educators or parents what to think. It supports the thinking. And so who doesn't want that for themselves or their family? Well, look, I know I got a long way to go in terms of being the best husband I can be. So I'm going to be practicing my SEL skills so I can go home to my wife and say, Aaliyah told me she was getting herself together. So I'm going to do the same for you and mm-hmm. practice my self-management and my relationship skills, my communication skills, my problem solving skills. Because I know as a, as a dad, I had to practice a lot of self-management with my two young boys, Elijah and Isaiah, because it's stressful being a parent and it's stressful mm-hmm. being a husband and it's stressful being a CEO. But I like to think I'm a little bit better at those things because I have these skills that I learned through SEL. That's right. That's right. And I believe it all. You know, I, I truly believe And not just having the skills, but how we talk about them, making the vocabulary so common practice, because I think that is also what bolsters an understanding of being able to say, you know what, I do feel 
frustrated or anxious. And I know I don't necessarily make good decisions when I'm in that headspace. Let me regroup. And that's what we're trying to teach our boys is like, you know, how are you managing yourself right now? What are you really feeling? And can you make a good decision right now? So no, let's stop. Let's think. Let's process. And these are skills that take practice. We all need to practice that. Let me take you back on this because I think about this notion of what it means to be a parent. We were talking about parenting. We're talking about different places. And I'm always surprised on how much what I do, my boys are paying attention to. My language, the way I interact with my wife, how we solve problems or don't. Especially my, my older son, Elijah, man, he is, he's just watching everything I do and say. And not that Isaiah is not, but Elijah is particularly watching it. And so I like to think about the way I show up as a dad and social emotional skills that I demonstrate how that impacts him as a young man, a young Black man growing up in the world, right? And how he understands himself and what his responsibilities are in relationships. The way that we show up as parents is also impacted by our SEL skills. And it's not about what we do, right? But it is about kind of what we're trying to accomplish and model for our young people. That's right. I'd love to answer this in two different ways. One, I think about, it was a middle school that I visited on a site visit. And every third Thursday, they had parent Thursday. Herb Assembly Unison School. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And what I loved about that model is the issues that the students surfaced as primary concerns, things that were impacting their learning, things that were impacting their relationships, they brought to the teacher for a facilitated conversation. And parents could join in so that they could hear the concerns that the students were raising. They could hear the dialogue between the students and the teacher. They could understand the vocabulary. And then what those parents did is they continued the conversations at home. Yeah. So that, I think it's so important to have that trusting environment between parents and schools and kids, because we know that parents are the number one underutilized resource in any school. And I say that as a parent and I say that as an educator. Mm -hmm. So we need to be thinking about how do we help parents understand what's happening in school, have a language that they feel equipped with to have that dialogue, and then it fosters the trust. So yeah. absolutely, from a school perspective, and then as a parent perspective, you know, I think about it as a parent. I know that I know my boys best. So I want to be able to have that relationship with the teacher to say, hey, Mrs. H. Cruz did not sleep well this weekend. He hasn't been feeling well. He's super anxious about this math test now. I just want you to know what's going on with him. So that if he does show up in a different mental space or place, she's able to say, okay, I know what's going on here and help direct him and coach him. And then also, I said two, but the last thing, which will make three, it's that, you know, I think about my grandmother who used to say, kids don't do what you say, they do what you do. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. Mm -hmm. Kids are watching us and their little mental recorders are recording everything we do say, and it will be the place in which it feels familiar to them. So they, as they get older, they will respond from that place because it's right. familiar to them. And it's also what they have inadvertently learned. Yeah. And I think some of this discourse that is happening, that is not a good example for our kids. We need to understand that they're watching and, and create a different model for that. This idea that schools and parents need to be in competition for their children's kind of soul or their children's social emotional development, I think it belies the notion that uh, we know parents are the first teachers of their children. And to your point, really, it's about this cooperation. It's about like, how are we in schools working with parents to deliver young people to the world equipped to solve problems? And when you talk about your son and saying, hey, you know, Mrs. H, he struggled on this. Mrs. H is saying, okay, well, what kind of environment can I construct to support him? How can I create scaffolds and prompts so that he understands how to persist and problem solve? You're all like the wonder twins. You're out here working together on behalf of your young person so that you can deliver him into the world ready to go. And, you know, I, I really appreciate that call out because for so many people who think SEL is for those kids or for them, not for me, it's not, you know, my kids are good. The reality of it is we all are going to coexist in community together. Mm -hmm. Our kids are going to grow up. They're going to become adults. They may move to different states and communities, maybe different countries. Who knows? But 
they will all be in community together. So we have to think about the impacts to our broader community. And I, I also appreciate that school example. When you really look at the teacher demographics, teachers usually reside within the community in which they teach. Mm -hmm. So it's not a us versus them. Our teachers are usually in the very same community. So we need to be thinking about this from a community building lens and not the opposition. Well, we're going to talk about this show and the idea here is about innovations. And we've been talking about SEL. We talk about community building. I want to talk about solving problems. You know, Leah, I'm all about solving problems here at the UA. Make things work is our number one strategic priority. So I want to talk about what challenge in education has Castle made progress in and how have you solved problems on behalf of the SEL field? Woo! So I'm going to take year one, kind of a, a recap. And in year two, in year one, so much of the challenge was diffusing the national discourse around what SEL is or yeah. what it was not. There was a fury of activity at the national level with headline after headline after headline around what SEL was and in many cases, what it was not. Mm -hmm. Being willing to look into the eye of that storm to say, I know that there's all these things brewing around about what it is, but let's get into the center of this and let's start to really diffuse what's going on. Like understand what the challenges are, but let's also get to some truth because there was so much misinformation. And that is really where we started to unpack and understand parents really had a lot of questions. And so we needed to focus on parent understanding. We had many policymakers who also didn't have an understanding of what it was, and they were just spewing out what they thought or what was told to them. Mm. And so taking time to be intentional, to be out in the field and engage with these different constituents and spend the time understanding, tell me what your concerns are. Yes. Tell me what is causing, you know, your anxiousness or your reservation around SEL. And let's put that on the table and start these conversations. So that was a huge challenge because truly there was headline after headline coming out. And if we didn't stand up and stand up quickly and firmly, I think we would have just got caught up in the snowball. So that was one I think going into year two, one of the challenges that I really believe Castle will help resolve is we're not talking to young people. Mm -hmm. We're not, we are not elevating their voices. So it's all these adult fucking heads without saying, hey, come sit down, young person, share our story, share your story, help us understand. And we need to spend more time engaging with young people, lifting up their voices, because David, the world that they're existing in, we didn't have, we maybe had beepers, you know, like. I'd have a beeper. I'd have a beeper? No, well, that was too I cool for school, you know. I had a pay phone, Aaliyah. I had a pay phone and I had to talk real quick to my parents to tell them to pick me up. Yeah, see? see? So that's our reality. But for this reality, for the, these young people, they have a phone that is the gateway to so much information. So much. And what SEL will do for those young people is help them say, wait a minute, I know I may really want attention or I want to belong to this group, but if I post this, mm. if I say this online, what's the implication longer term? So I need mm. to make a responsible decision. The things that this generation has to face, you know, at 15, 16, 17, 12, we weren't dealing with these challenges mm -hmm. or, or realities. And so it's even more important that we help these young people have these skills so that they can overcome not just challenges and obstacles in this digital world, but we're preparing a workforce for jobs that we don't even know exist yet. So we need young people who can think creatively, who can persist through really complex problems, who can work with other people to be able to create the future. That's really what we're talking about. And so I really believe that if Castle continues to put its focus on the human voice and the student voice and the educator voice, it will help chisel away at this problem about what should education look like. 
Well, yeah, you've sold me. I'm a convert to the SEL nation. <laughs> your vision around workforce development, your vision around problem solving for our youth and their ability to navigate all the different kinds of technologies and situations that necessarily weren't on ours. Your vision for a future where we're listening to each other and taking perspective and understanding. Your vision for an education that's holistic, that is supported by relationships, developing the whole child, the academics. Those are things that you've sold me on. I believe in the things that you're talking about. I believe in the work that you're doing at Castle. And I believe this innovation in public education is worth having. I'm really excited to see what year two looks like and year three and year four and year 10 and 11 and 12, because we got a lot of work to do. And it looks like you're the person to make it happen. Well, thank you, David. I was invited to serve as a keynote for a women in leadership breakfast. And I said it to the group and I fundamentally believe it, that when you find your purpose and passion, everything else falls in line. And this work I am so fortunate to do because I believe it fits my purpose and the fact that I've seen so much as an educator and we see what's happening in the field of education. And I know what public education did for my own life. I wouldn't be here without it. So there's a real connection to my personal purpose and then my fundamental passion to make sure that every young person can be the best that they can be. And just to help provide that foundation and those skills, I just think are so important. So I consider myself blessed to do. It's hard work, but it's hard work. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here for the long haul. Our kids deserve nothing but the best. So mm -hmm. onward we go. Onward we go. And on behalf of the Urban Assembly and Public Education at Large, Dr. Leah Samuel, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your leadership in Castle. Thank you for your devotion for the highest quality of social and emotional learning. Thank you, David. Have a great rest of the day. You too. Thanks for listening to our latest episode of Innovations in Education, where we bring education leaders who have made things work in the education sector. If you like this episode, please subscribe so that you can hear more great content around innovations in education. I've been your host, David Adams. Have a great day. Thank you.